cheat, right? From the time you're a little kid, you don't cheat. Play by the rules. You share, you be nice. Honesty is a fundamental value. Not an American value, just a fundamental human value, honesty. Billy Joel said it was a lonely word. Before that, Olivia Newton-John told me that she honestly loved me. <laughs> but those were interpersonal questions, weren't they? Um, and I'm not really here to talk about the interpersonal. Honesty is an interpersonal issue. In fact, cheating, if you engage in infidelity, we refer to it as cheating, right? Che even that word. But what I want to talk about today a little bit is what cheating looks like in public. Focusing on primarily issues of government and sports, but where I'll land is in academia. Because at another interpersonal level, we tell you and we write on our syllabi, don't cheat, don't plagiarize, be academically honest. And as we'll see, that relates to professors as well as, it, as to students. So let's consider these three constructs. We have the notion of cheating, um, but around that is notions of corruption, which is related. And I'm going to introduce something that you might not have thought of, the notion of gamesmanship. It's a gendered term, um, but there's not a better one to, to describe this construct. Let's drill down. The broad definition of cheating is that it's breaking the rules to get ahead academically, professionally, uh, or financially. This is from Callahan. That should sound pretty familiar to you. Um, of course, it, it doesn't have to be those three things. You can cheat in board games, you can cheat in checkers or whatever, you can cheat in other ways. But as, since we're talking about public, th these are sort of what we are. The question is, what about those rules? Just because there are rules doesn't make them just, doesn't make them ethical or moral, doesn't mean that I have to agree with them or endorse them. The premise, though, for accusing somebody of engaging in cheating is that the offender is aware of the rules and makes a conscious decision to break them. The notion of gamesmanship, before we get there, is cheating without the rules. Right? That's not the formal definition, but cheating without the rules. Think about in sports. The picture that I showed you here is an NBA player flopping. Right? It's, it's against the rules in the NBA to make contact with somebody in a way that, that provides an advantage to you. Um, that, that's, that's pretty fluid though, right? Because you can touch, you can bump. If I get bumped and I pretend like I got bumped harder than I actually did, it's called a flop. And until recently, that wasn't against the rules. Now they can call a foul on the flop. But it was sort of selling things a little bit, right? So let's imagine that I, you and I are playing tennis. And, and the ball hits the line, hits the baseline. And I see it hit the baseline, but I say it was out. There's no rule in informal tennis that I have to tell the truth. But there's an assumption that I will, right? It's an ethical assumption that I'm not going to fib, that I'm not going to uh, advantage myself in some way that's improper, right? Um, so the question here is that when you have transgressions in gamesmanship, they're ethical transgressions, but they don't necessarily have consequences that are legal. What can you do to me? You might not play tennis with me any longer. That wouldn't be a bad idea, right? Because, uh, but I'm not technically cheating, right? I'm engaging in some sort of gamesmanship. Corruption's a little bit different. Here we have the framers, and they were really worried about corruption, right? We know that they, 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 they thought that, that, that the British crown was oppressive, uh, and, and so you get the Declaration of Independence, and you get Dr. Sh I'm glad Dr. Shara uh, Elahi left because uh, my history is so fast and, and, and improper, um, not doing justice to what happened. But, but we, then we come up with these set of rules, and part of the rules are in place to have a real sense that there will not be an advantage given uh, to individuals uh, based on their status. Short of having term limits, which of course they considered, um, the idea was you wouldn't stay in office too long because there would be a corrupting influence. Just by being there for a long time could lead to some sort of corruption. This concept, however, has evolved. Right? That's not how we talk about corruption now. So I'll read these quotes to you. Um, Justice Berger and the Buckley decision, right? The Buckley decision is the, is the big decision on campaign finance. It sort of sets up the campaign finance system we had today, or that we had for about 35 years anyway. 
And Justice Berger says, the reality and appearance of improper influence stemming from the dependence of candidates on large campaign contributions. That's what we ought to be concerned about. So Congress has the right to limit direct contributions from individuals, though it may not limit how much individuals can spend independently. That's essentially the Buckley decision, right? Very different than what Justice Roberts puts forward in his opinion um, of the FEC case just last year where he defines corruption as a contribution to a particular candidate in exchange for his agreeing to do a particular act within his official duties. That's very different. That's quid pro quo. That's our modern definition of corruption. Unless I can show that the money that I got led me to take a certain action, I can argue that there's no corruption. That causality is problematic, right? Because interest groups, PACs, funding agencies, et cetera, will support candidates to reward them for their positions. And that's what politicians will say. I didn't vote this way because I got the money from this group. I got the money from this group because I vote this way. Right? So that can't be corruption. Not under the current definition, that's true, but if you go back to the framers and even go back to the 1970s, there's a little more room for that, right? Okay. So what do we do with all this? How do we make sense of it? Well, we start with Richard Nixon. He wasn't the first person to be corrupt. <laughs> uh, but we're starting there because in the modern era, he tends to define corruption. In fact, the notion of the Watergate situation provides us with a, a, a suffix, gate, that we stick at the end of any scandal, right? Including football scandals, as we'll see in just a moment, right? That this becomes the definition. Again, there's a break-in in the Watergate Hotel where the Democratic National Committee had its headquarters in 1972. That's not a huge deal. It's not good. But it's not a huge deal. But subsequently, though, there was a very high level cover up in the White House, which led not to President Nixon being impeached. He was not. He resigned prior to impeachment. But he certainly would have been, right? Corruption. I don't think you're going to argue with me there. This strapping young fellow, we all know. I won't say no one loves, but we all know him. Uh, the former governor of Illinois, corrupt, right? Indicted on several charges in 2009. Um, uh, b besides being impeached and removed from his office, uh, is serving a 14-year sentence in federal prison uh, because he uh, tried to sell President Obama's Senate seat. Uh, he also uh, had a couple of other incidents where he was uh, taking money p for personal use as a result in exchange for favors that he could provide as a result of his position. So I don't think we're going to have a lot of argument whether that was gamesmanship, uh, whether that was cheating, or whether that was corruption. This guy's not corrupt, this little man. That's my son. Uh, and he's adorable and not corrupt yet. Um, he's holding a sign for the Jackie Robinson West All-Stars. And you'll remember last summer, those of you who were in the area, this is the, the, team, the Little League team that captured the hearts, not just of Chicago, although disproportionately so, but of the country. Uh, an inner city squad uh, of scrappy players uh, who ended up winning uh, the US championship in Little League Baseball, only to fall in the International World Series. Um, a few months later, uh, they were stripped of that title because it was discovered that some of the players uh, came from outside the boundaries of where the Jackie Robinson West All-Stars were supposed to be in the city. Uh, something, of course, that the kids probably uh, didn't, may not even have known, but even if they did know, uh, it, was, it was coaches and parents that made those decisions. Uh, heartbreaking, right? Because we don't get, uh, you know, we might get frustrated that Rob Blagojevich does bad stuff, but these kids are so cute, right? And they, and they, and they played so well and they were so polite, right? Uh, you know, the one kid get, get, hit, hits a home run and puts his arm up in the air and at the next half inning goes over to the dugout of the other coach to apologize if it looked like he was showing up the team. He was just selling. I mean, he's doing everything right. This is us in Millennium Park after the parade and the, and the rally last summer. The hearts get broken, although not his heart. I didn't tell him. <laughs> he doesn't know anything about this part, so we won't let him see any of this. This strapping young fellow as well, is Tom Brady. And you know about inflate gate, deflate gate, right? Um, hashtag deflated balls, hashtag whatever it is. After uh, the AFC championship game, it was discovered that uh, some of the footballs that the New England Patriots were using uh, had uh, less than the pressure per square inch allowance that the NFL uh, allows. Uh, because Tom Brady likes to have the balls a little less deflated because he has better control over it. He can squeeze it a little tighter, he has better control. Uh, investigation comes out a couple of weeks ago, the Wells report that says uh, it's more likely than not that Tom Brady had knowledge of um, the situation. 
that seems generous. Uh, if you watch Tom Brady's press conference afterwards, Tom Brady goes at great length to tell you about how he has this very detailed routine before games and that he ver cares very much how much pressure's in the balls. Uh, and he doesn't say anything about whether he likes it less or more, but, but, but he, he can touch the balls and he knows that he wants them rubbed a certain way so the oils are the right way. And then he goes on to say that he had no, he, nothing seemed strange to him at all the whole first half uh, that he was playing with under inflated footballs. Those two things can't both be true, right? If he's so precise, he had to know something was wrong. Um, uh, and so there's suggestions and there were sanctions, um, but, but Brady maintains of course, that, that he didn't do it. Gamesmanship, probably not, probably cheating, right? I mean, there were strict rules about the PSI, there were less, whether or not, uh, and by the way, I should mention, if you're not following this story, there's no accusation that Tom Brady deflated the balls himself. Uh, the process is that the, the balls are inspected by the NFL, and a ball boy carrying the bag full of balls on the way to the field stopped at the restroom for 90 seconds uh, before he went to the field, and that's where the balls uh, allegedly were deflated. This is Jeb Bush. Jeb Bush has, has come under uh, uh, some fire lately because while not officially a candidate for president of the United States in 2016, he's, he's uh, let it be known that, that he has intentions in that direction and has, his movements suggest, that's code for spends a lot of time in Iowa, his movements suggest that that's what he's going to do. The reason he hasn't officially declared yet though is because he's heading up a candidate PAC, a super PAC, that can raise lots and lots of money. Um, that can later be used for his campaign so long as he's no longer involved with the PAC. But if he's officially a candidate, he is not allowed to have, legally, he's not allowed to have any involvement with that group. A um, couple weeks ago in an interview, he slipped and said, I'm running for president because, and then caught himself and said, if I run, and then continued with his sentence, which led a lot of people to say, this is illegal. The PAC is illegal. The fundraising is absolutely illegal because it's clear that he's running. Cheating? Maybe, certainly at least gamesmanship. Um, he, he knows he's planning to run, uh, but he also knows that he's going to be at a fundraising advantage if he continues in this vein uh, without officially declaring uh, for some time. This is Will Smith, not the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. That that's also Will Smith. This is a, a relief pitcher for the, the, the uh, Milwaukee Brewers, who a couple of weeks ago was ejected from a game because of this substance you might be able to see on his arm. It is against the rules in, in baseball for pitchers to put foreign substance on their hands before they throw the ball, other than rosin, which are, which are bags that are sort of uh, placed around the mound to dry their hands. But it's very well known that pitchers do it all the time. Sometimes, you'll see, you ever wonder why pitchers are always adjusting their hat? There's usually a little something under the brim. Do you ever wonder why they're always yanking up their pants? There's usually a little something inside the belt. Why they're always touching their glove? There's usually a little something inside the glove. And in fact, um, the rule is in place so that the ball doesn't act in strange ways, right? That it's not weighted differently and, and then it's confusing and harder to hit. But a little bit of this helps main, the pitchers maintain control. Batters generally don't complain, which is why it's not cracked down on. And you might ask why? The reason, if you ask why, that's because you've never stood really close to a 98 mile an hour baseball coming at your face. Uh, the batters are pretty happy that pitchers have a little extra control when the ball is coming in that way, and so they generally don't complain about it. Um, the, the error here, of course, was having it in plain sight with a big glob of, he, he said it was sunscreen, although that's a very strange looking sunscreen to me. He uh, said it was sunscreen, he just didn't rub it in very well, so maybe his mom wasn't at the game uh, to help him, help him rub it in. So that's, that's an issue. Gamesmanship, probably. Uh, it's a violation of the rules, but again, with that understanding that, that sort of everybody does it. And I promised you that I would land here. The political science community, if there is one, uh, was rocked in the last two weeks uh, because it was the biggest uh, ever data fabrication story uh, to come out in our field. It's not the first, uh, it's not the first uh, uh, story where a scientist uh, w was found to have uh, fabricated data. But it's the first one in political science and certainly the most prominent uh, in political science. Here's what happened very quickly. I won't go through the whole story, and I'm not going to name names because, again, the people involved have been, uh, have been uh, dragged around in the media. You can look it up. But essentially, um, there were some findings that came out in a journal article late last year that suggested that um, there was a, a, a strong effect of canvassing, that is, going door-to-door -door and talking to voters, um, changing a, a potential voter's or a citizen's mind about gay marriage after having a, a, a conversation with somebody who identified as gay. 
Political scientists have known for some time that canvassing has minimal effects and that, that those effects are sort of limited. Uh, most of the reason why political candidates can canvass, for instance, is not to convince you to vote for them, but to collect data about whether you plan to, whether you don't plan to, so that they can help get out the vote, make sure you show up to vote, and so forth the next time. It's not to try to change your mind. Um, we know that interpersonal communication can change people's minds, but mostly people that you know, not a stranger just showing up at your door. But the effects that were found here were dramatic. So dramatic that some graduate students started getting interested in this and wondering if they should do studies like this. And as they tried to replicate the findings, it became more and more clear that they were just too good. And, and then questions came up about the funding sources, uh, whether the uh, organization that, that um, uh, executed the, uh, the plan, uh, the study actually did it, had any association with this researcher. The tricky thing was that it was a grad student that was responsible for most of this paper, uh, but was co-authored by a very prominent political scientist at Columbia University, the grad students at UCLA. Um, as soon as it was brought to the attention of the professor, the professor called Science Magazine. Again, this is not some obscure journal in political science, right? This is a really big, a big deal. And asked for a retraction, which they granted in this issue just last week. Um, in, in the interim, the graduate student has responded, saying it was academic ambush. Uh, there's been some back and forth. Um, but but it, it's, it's very difficult to believe that, the, the, first of all, it was difficult to believe the data were correct in the first place because they were so dramatic. And secondly, he admits to have destroying the data set. So there's no way to verify them at this point. Um, so that's a, that's a kind of cheating, I think, that brings us full circle. Sort of where are we with this? What, the, whole, the point of this lecture, though, is really to get you to think about these things in a more complex way. How do we tie it all together? Uh, breaking the rules isn't breaking the rules isn't breaking the rules. There's different types. There's different contexts under which th th those kind of rules are broken. And, and we have to push against the, 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 the quality of the rules. With respect to political science, um, you know, I saw one article that argued, as bad as this is, it showed that the scientific process does work. That, when, that the reason replication is important is that when you try it, we can find out that something went wrong. Uh, but that's not the idea. Of, the idea of replication isn't to try to catch people cheating. The idea of replication is to see if the findings hold under different circumstances. So nonetheless, uh, we have a problem. Uh, it's not a widespread problem in political science necessarily, but we don't know how widespread of a problem it is. In professional sports, the, the problems are there, um, and, and some of them are dealt with. The most heartbreaking part of all of this, though, is not the graduate student uh, who may not now have a job at Princeton, as he expected that he would next year. Uh, it is not Tom Brady. He's going to be fine. Nobody needs to have a bake sale for Tom Brady. Uh, the, pro the bigger problem, I think the heartbreaking part of all of this, is the Jackie Robinson West All-Star. Um, because those kids, not only, uh, it's not that they, it'll follow them forever. I don't think we'll all remember their names and hold them to it. Most, I think, uh, believe that they individually didn't have, a, uh, didn't have a stake in this. But to work so hard and to do what they thought was right for all those months and years of training and then to have their title stripped is truly heartbreaking. And so as we sort of think about these, these different categories and constructs, um, keep those little kids in mind. And uh, the takeaway point is, don't cheat. Thank you. Thank you.